name is Simone Leitão, a Brazilian pianist, and today I will talk about Heitor Villa Lobos, our greatest composer of all time. It is really important for you to know about him because if you want to know something of Brazilian art music, you need to know about Heitor Villa Lobos. O Brasil já tem uma forma geográfica de um coração. Todo brasileiro tem esse coração. Why is he the greatest? Well, he was the most prolific composer of Brazil, and he is known to be the most important composer of South America. He composed more than a thousand opuses, and he brought into the universal language of classical music, of symphonic music, the identity of Brazil, the true identity of Brazil. He went down to learn about the Brazil's folklore. He was brought up in a very distinctive uh, way. He could listen to classical music every day in his home, but he also played Brazilian music in the streets called Choros. It's a typical urban music from Rio de Janeiro. He was born in Rio in 1887. Well, that was a very important decade for Brazil. It was the decade of reforms. He was born in 87. In 88, slavery was abolished. I know, we were the last ones. In 89, we became a republic. Yes, we were the only ones who had a king in the Americas, I believe, yes. Brazil was then only 10 million people living in Brazil and still as big as it is today. So we were basically a very rural country and our aesthetics and our music our art music was all European driven and he was brought up in a house his, his father worked for the government and he worked at the National Library and he was very key into music and astronomy but Villa Lobos would hear classical music and chamber music every night in his home because his aunt and his mother played the piano his father played the guitar the cello he learned his first instrument was cello and then guitar. Finally, he went and started having some lessons, but he decided to make a path of his own and learn music his own way. So he basically didn't have a formal musical education. When he was young, he was already making a living playing instruments, basically cello and guitar. He was playing on operas and sometimes even cafes. He also played the guitar in Choros Ensemble. What is Choro? Choro is a very improvisatory Carioca. Carioca, people from Rio de Janeiro are Carioca, okay? So we call them Carioca. So it's a typical, it, it was very Carioca, urban, improvisatory music. It's like chamber music, but you have to improvise. But then again, choro is not easy at all, because you need to be very technically prepared to play choros, and you need to be very free to improvise. So you need to be a great musician to be a choro musician. So he, he was brought up in these two environments. Around the year 1908 or something, he went on a tour on his own. When he was really young, he had an opportunity when he was a child, he had an opportunity to see rural Brazil because his father spent some time in a state called Minas Gerais. It's my state, up in the mountains. So he had this opportunity to see Brazil very folkloric, so to speak. When he was around 20 years old, he went on a tour on northeast of Brazil and he was basically compiling rhythms, folklore, with all the diversity that Brazil has in terms of rhythm, music, songs, identities from Europeans, other Europeans rather than Portuguese, and of course the indigenous people, the African Brazilians. And finally he said this his entire life, that he lived among Amazon people, a time where Amazon was just an idea, people wouldn't even go there, you just had the First Nations living there. So he said he lived in a tribe and so on. So this is kind of one of his mythology about himself. We never know. But truth is, he brought all these sounds, not only of the people, but of the forest, of the nature, the birds, all the riches of Brazil he brought with him in a time that the whole European tradition was already going down in favor even in Europe. Okay, let's remember that in 1914 there was the First World War. Around 1917 
the whole world, including Europe, they were very disappointed with themselves. Everybody wasn't disappointed with Europe. So to find a new aesthetics, a new way of living, a new way of thinking was very important. And that's when Villa Lobos was arising as a composer. In 1917, he was about then 30 years old. He finally met Milho, Darius Milho. He's a French composer. He came to Brazil to live here as a secretary. I don't know, he, he had some position in the government, the French government, and he had an opportunity to show to Villa Lobos all the new music that was going on in Paris, Stravinsky, of course, Debussy, Havel and everything, and Villa Lobos was showing him the music of Brazil. In 1918, he met his champion, one of his best friends for his entire life, Arthur Rubinstein, the great pianist from Poland. Well, Rubinstein said, You are the answer everybody was waiting for. You have the model music of Brazil and everybody should listen to your music. Back then, Villa Lobos was very much into writing childhood scenes. You know, Schumann, Schumann wrote a lot of childhood scenes. Well, that's nothing in comparison to what Villa Lobos was writing. He married the great Brazilian pianist Lucilia when in 1913. So in 1918, he already had a lot of pieces written for solo piano. He didn't play piano, she kind of taught him. And he self-taught, of course, he was always self-teaching. And even that you can see in his music, his piano music that he decided new techniques for the instrument because he was seeing the piano more so as a guitar or as a percussion instrument not as a piano this way he had a whole new way of writing music for the piano first he wrote the children's brazilian children's carnival which is a suite of just miniature pieces that were very descriptive and then he wrote the baby's family probably the bebe number one which is also not a suite all of these suites had to do with the childhood universe in brazil a Brazilian childhood, for instance. He was a child who was very happy. So basically, he was bringing his scenes back into the piano. It was very smart to do so because nobody was doing that in Brazil as well. So with that kind of music, Rubinstein started playing. He's brought it to Bebe, number one. And Rubinstein was talking a lot to the Brazilian government and some very wealthy families, for instance, the Gingli family, to make an allowance so that he, Villa Lobos, could live in Paris for a while and so that he could show Brazilian music, Brazilian art music to the Parisians into this whole atmosphere. And so he, he went, he left to Paris in 1923. He lived there for one year and then came back to Brazil and then went back again in France from 1927 to 30. And there he made friends, he was very good friends of Edgar Varese, friends with uh, Leopold Stokowski, Aaron Copeland, and of course Stravinsky was there too. So he had a chance to exchange ideas and way of writing music. But one thing he was very sure of, he knew that as a Brazilian he could be seen just as, a, as an exotic piece and then people would like to teach him the European way of writing music. That he was very sure of. When he arrived in Paris, the first thing he said to the intelligentsia there is that I didn't come here to learn, I came here to show my music to you. Some people say that I use the folklore. I said, he said, I am the folklore. Well, he did have this high self-esteem, but it was very important for him and it was very important for Brazil as well. That time he met someone very important to him, Andres Segovia, the great Spanish guitar player. Well, Andres Segovia asked him to write a study. Write me a study for the, for the guitar. Then Villalobos wrote him 12 studies. These 12 studies are basically what the Chopin etudes for the piano are for us. So we can say Villalobos is a Chopin of the guitar. Only if we could analyze his output for the guitar, it would already make him one of the greatest and most important composers of the 20th century. But he did not only write for the guitar. He wrote 206 solo piano pieces. He didn't like the piano, imagine if he did. And he wrote numerous works for voice and of course orchestra, 17 quartets, 10 works for piano and orchestra. Well, in 1928, something really interesting happened to the greatest Brazilian pianist back then lived in, living in Paris called Madalia Natalia Ferro. She used to call herself just Magda, Magda Natalia Ferro. She commissioned him. You remember the childhood scenes, Brazilian carnival childhood scenes? She said, well, you should take this suite for solo piano and make it into a big fantasy for piano and orchestra. And so he wrote Momo Precoce, the fantasy for piano and orchestra, written from the childhood 
scenes of the carnival, Brazilian carnival. So this work is the most important Brazilian work for piano and orchestra. I'm also going to make a video on this work. It's very important and we can, I can show you some of it here on the piano. Okay, we are gonna end here now because we're gonna have another video on his late years, not late years, but his middle middle period and his late period. He lived up to 1959 and we're gonna stop around 1930 now. And also he invented a different genre that is not a symphony or a fantasy or impromptu, any of this sort. Imagine Chopin. Chopin brought into Mazurka, which is something very, very Polish, to piano playing. Then all, everybody has to play a mazurka and then we have to feel like we are Polish to play a mazurka. So the same thing Villa Lobos did. He wrote a series called Choros and it's very tropical. And Choros doesn't mean that he's gonna write Choros only for the piano or only for the guitar. He wrote many Choros and these Choros are for all sorts of media. Piano solo, guitar solo, two instruments, chamber music, only uh, strings, big orchestra, orchestra and choir, orchestra and two pianos, orchestra and one piano. And basically what he, he wanna show in this show the sounds of Brazil. That was a very tropical idiom that he found. So basically this is it and we'll be back uh, talking about Villa Lobos next in the next video and I would like for you to comment below if you think Villa Lobos should be thought of as the most important or the most prolific composer of the Americas and not only Brazil because I sometimes think who wrote more the Envila Lobos in the Americas. So comment below and then let me know about you, what you think, and ask me questions, I would love to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Simone Leitão. I'm a pianist from Brazil. Also, uh, I have a doctorate degree in piano performance and music history. Today, we're going to talk about Heitor Villa Lobos, Brazilian composer. Before we go on talking about him, this, the greatest composer from Brazil of all times, please subscribe to, to my channel. Let me know what you think. Give me your like or dislike. No, not dislike. I will take it again. Eu detesto pedir para as pessoas se inscreverem no meu canal. É, é para ficar conectada nos próximos vídeos. É. Ok. Vou ter que fazer de novo a cabeça. A cabeça de novo. Hello, my name is Simone Leitão. I'm a pianist from Brazil. Today we're going to talk about Heitor Villalobos, the greatest composer from Brazil of all times. Before we go on talking about the great master, I would love for you to subscribe to my channel uh, and also comment, ask questions. And please don't miss out on anything that I post because, of course, I post piano playing, but I post also talking. And you would like to know more about the, the music from Brazil, art music from Brazil. So let's move on. <laughs> 